but also with the participatory elements in in weird weekends that in terms of structuring a, a film structuring a program that you've got something to build to you've got something to to react to so in terms of the narrative of that film then the participatory element was surely a sort of crutch that you could lean on whereas with here there must have been a great terror as the point that I was alluding to earlier about suddenly you haven't got a big cast of characters you haven't got a participatory sort of crutch to fall back on how do you structure a film when you've got one point of access and one story to follow I mean that's a great point because in the weird weekends days we used to be we used to get before we'd shot a single frame we would put cards on a wall and we'd even before we'd cast characters we'd have archetypes in the porn we knew we wanted a hungry young male and uh, that he would carry us to his first or a, a shoot and that we would also have a sort of uh, you know that we I had beats what we, you know beats on my journey and there were beats on different characters journey that there was a climactic or sort of semi-climactic moment that represented the far end of my involvement but that that would then trigger a conversation in which I confronted and challenged um, the person who was in that world for real right which was a sort of second climax in which I so so they were all it was all sort of plotted out and it would usually go more or less you know to plan with um when we did When Louis Met, as you rightly say, it was a much more freeform um, kind of thing, and it became a, uh, we'd have to, we couldn't really plan it as much, and it, in some ways it was quite liberating. It, in, you know, in other ways it was awful because you have to sort of tiptoe around people if you think that they are going to pull access if you ask the wrong question, and I hate tiptoeing. You know, I, I really do like to try and get my cards on the table quite early on. Um, which is one of the reasons when I did uh, a, sto a story about Anne Widdicombe on the first morning that I met her, and I got a bit of flack for this, I said something about, um, and you've said in public that you're a virgin or something. And, and it was a question, she, I think she had said it in a previous interview, and I just thought, you know, I'm not going to build up to that question. Let's just get it out of the way. And um, there was a slightly awkward moment. But um, it, it, it becomes about... Make building a narrative in which there are ebbs and flows of closeness and bits of action, but you the sh the short the bottom line is you can't really plan it in the same way. But is it about creating that tension with someone who has got something to hide, which is something we'll come back to when we talk about Savile? That that with all of those individuals in when Louis meets, that there was a sort of sense that. They had a dignity or something they wanted to hide or cover up. Definitely, or, uh, there was a there's a something that they're trying to hide. There was usually a, a piece of action, although it might be loosely defined. Paul Daniels and Debbie McGee were launching a ballet company um, that was touring theatres around Britain, Ballet Imaginaire, um, and Debbie. It was Debbie's dream project, so it follows that the launch of that, and then it kind of hit the buffers. Um, with Jimmy Savile, it's more about his endless uh, sort of self-promotion, really, and his life as a series of stage-managed events designed to promote and kind of um, uh, buff his image and his um, sort of, yes, his, his popular esteem. And uh, but then in other ones, Chris Eubank, I didn't want Chris Eubank the boxer. Didn't it was just sort of his public events, and in most cases, as you say, there is a difference between the public and the private. And in terms of the perception, the audience perception of you at that time, you were getting multi-million viewers. I mean, I haven't mm -hmm. got the figures in front of me, but there was you I know that probably was tell you what they go all on got. Then. Well, episode by episode. Uh, no, I joking. think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you can do. Savile was four and a half million, I think. Paul and Debbie was slightly more, 4.8, I think. The Hamiltons, I think, was five and a bit. Anyway, so it's, it's huge, fascinating. No, but hugely, hugely popular series that, as I say, broke out of sort of a niche audience. And then what in terms for for you were you what was your self perception were you did you see yourself as well these are amazing popular documentaries did you look at the rest of the documentary landscape and think look i'm getting the audiences that you're not getting or did you see yourself as doing something different i wasn't really conscious of anyone else's ratings and to be honest with you 
in some ways, it was part of my least happy working experience in, in, in the sense that having, I, I just sort of couldn't see, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, there's, there's two factors, aren't there? There's what you're doing now and, the, and there's your sense of where it will lead. And as much as it was, I was getting great ratings, I couldn't, I just couldn't see where it would go because I'd, I'd reached, and I remember being told by people I worked with at the time saying, you know, this is the impact we need to, to aim for after the, the, the Hamiltons had gone out, you know, five and a half million. From now on, that's the impact we want. And I had never gone into TV thinking, well, I, I want to get maximum impact. I'd just gone into it thinking, what a privilege to be able to explore worlds that I'm fascinated by, and I think I can tell stories about them. And uh, so it suddenly felt like I had I had it all the wrong way around. And as a result of that, I I I actually had to, I ended up taking a break of a year and a half and going off and, and writing a book and sort of trying to get back to uh, some sense of what I what I did and because um, I felt I'd gone down a bit of a cul-de-sac. And so then you moved your focus back to the the U.S. and a series of Louis specials. Um, I remember we reached out. the point where um, uh, we just ran out of road on the kind of celebrities. That I was pleased that the last one we did was about Max Clifford and was a good one. So I felt we ended on a good moment, uh, and and then we had two more, uh, three more shows to make, and I was told. Uh, I remember. My series producer at the time said, well, why don't we forget about Access and you just make um, whatever show you would, would be your dream project. Just what would, you, what would be your ideal ideas for, for documentaries? And I said, well, that's easy. Number one is Michael Jackson. And number two is Scientology. Uh, the Michael Jackson one we ended up making, it, I, think it's, I think it's pretty good, but it definitely is, uh, it was difficult to make and in some ways not totally satisfactory. The Scientology one, we're talking 2002, you know, so 14 years ago, uh, just sort of fizzled out. And then it was a case of, well, let, well, let's just make a program that we know we can make. And we did one about neo-Nazis called Lu Louis and the Nazis, uh, and one about a brothel called Louis and the Brothel. And then I said, okay, fine, I'm done for now, and, t and, and took time off. And, and and when I came back, I felt that I was in a position to sort of say, okay, I'll come back, but I, I, I just want to make uh, things that I'm interested in. And um, and it was luckily uh, the brothel and the neo-Nazis episodes did really well as well. And I'm still really proud of those shows. And it felt like they possibly painted a bit of pointed a bit of a way forward. And that they, I think, the takeaway as well from the when Louis Metz was that. We don't have to plan quite so much. We can just let the, it put me in situations or in worlds that are extreme and find our way through them. And you also get a, in some ways, a richer and more mature sort of narrative.